Hey everyone, welcome back to a brand new Take Aim podcast this week. Blake Garrett's with me from the Unfiltered Outdoor app, and we talk all things turkey hunting. Blake was just in Kansas, Missouri, a couple birds in Kansas, I should say, Nebraska, just slammed one last night in South Dakota as well. We talk about the crazy issues socially with the coronavirus and some of the state agency changing, shortening, even canceling some of the seasons around the nation. And as well, congrats to Blake on an amazing season, one that he will never forget, turkey hunting-wise. Just an awesome accomplishment on Blake's part, so congrats, buddy. Awesome work. All right, guys, we're live, brand new Take Aim podcast, and as always, excited to start the Turk Merc season or tour as always, every spring with Blake Garrett, and uh, excited to have Blake back on and talk some turkey hunting. What's up, Blake? Not much, man. On the road, headed home. Uh, been a long, long seven days, but very, very fun. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I've been, you know, like always, trying to follow you and see what you're up to and where you're at. And I was even uh, a little short on the turkey numbers when we were just talking offline because it, it's been like yeah. an explosion of dead birds everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I always try to make a run out west um, and really take advantage of the early season. You know, here in Missouri, we don't open till usually mid to, mid to late April. Um, so I really try to get, you know, out to Nebraska for their opener the 25th of March and try to shoot at least one bird with the bow then and then really April 1st and kind of start hitting, you know, Kansas and South Dakota and uh those other states too, um, just to try to get in some early hunts and get some birds down before uh, before really the brunt of of the turkey rut, as we call it, um, it happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, what's so crazy is you know it's so nice for you being so close to Nebraska, but it's crazy that state relatively compared to mine is a month before my state opens here in Michigan, and even Indiana, March twenty fifth. So literally you buy your license and then this whole COVID thing happens and you're like one of the lucky ones had already bought a license before they actually ended up canceling the season. I thought we we needed to talk about that a little bit just because like what are the odds of that happening? Yeah. Yeah. So super weird year. I mean, this is, you know, crazy. And I think the uncertainty just has a lot of people shook and, you know, heck, who knows? You know, I don't think anybody really knows what what all it's going to bring but it it brought the country to its knees that's for sure and kind of saw it coming you know there was talks about you know you see on facebook everybody's talking about you know canceling turkey seasons and stuff like that and I, i figured they wouldn't do that um but i did figure that the only way they could really manage the travel would be to shut down tags um so you know i bought every tag for out of state as early as possible and i actually bought them you know back at the beginning of march um, and got out all of them. I, I knew I was going to Nebraska to shoot two. I knew I was going to shoot two in Kansas, and I knew I was going to shoot. I could only shoot one in South Dakota. Um, so I just went and bought all those tags and had them. And I thought, you know, worst comes to the worst, they're going to tell me they are going to cancel it, and they're going to give my money back. Um, best case scenario, they're not going to do anything. Of course, they did something right in the middle, um, but we ended up being okay with it. Um, yeah, super interesting, and, you know, we went out there on the 25th, and I shot a bird. I think I didn't hunt the 25th, the actual opener. I, I was just helping, uh, had a buddy in camp, and we were kind of just really scouting and kind of moving around and trying to find some birds. And we uh, hunted 26, killed a bird that day, and then uh, my buddy had shot his birds already, too. So we just kind of got out of there, and we came back for um, – a couple of days uh, back in Missouri because youth season opened this last Saturday there. And of course, I was Hagen hunting, and I wanted to scout a little bit, so I scouted just a couple of days, just really just listen in the mornings um, on some of the farms to see where some birds were, and had one bird that really, really did everything that uh, that they do, you know, normally on that farm. So I kind of had him figured out and and moved a blind on him that day and then it set for two days and then we hunted for youth and it worked like a charm i mean went in there super uh, horrible conditions i mean 30 degrees uh 25 mile an hour north wind rain kind of dreary just rainy kind of just just honestly i didn't think we would kill him but went in and i got him to gobble um on the tree and then he gobbled one time on the ground and then about an hour later he just showed up in the field and um 
we're working with robotic decoys this year and uh, kind of a cool company that they really make their bread and butter out of selling moving decoys um, to game and parks and to the conservation departments for guys that shoot them off the road. I know you've seen those videos before of like guys getting out and shooting deer, yeah. robo deer. And stuff off How the they catch the bulgers. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So does this guy makes those decoys, and and he uh, he got a hold of me and wanted to kind of make some stuff for the hunting application. So we started kind of working together this year on, I don't know, kind of bridging the gap. I mean, there's some differences that you know hunters would need that that game wardens don't really um, have an issue with and things like that. So we're kind of playing with it. But he got me a turkey and a strutter, and it's beautiful and and moves. I mean, the movement's just unreal and. Anyway, we had it. That was really the first hunt um, for it that it, you know, the movement I think really helped us. But the bird came out 200 yards and really wasn't strutting, just kind of nervous, high head, you know, um, looking pretty hard and just just rotated it just a, uh, just a little bit. And I kept the fan up and just kind of rotated it. And, man, the bird just, it was like a light switch, you know, just came straight in, beeline, and Hagen shot him at like 14 yards, I think, um, right at the decoy. It so real quick. That was Ex- yeah. explain some of the movement of that decoy and how it operates yeah so it has a pretty big base on it it doesn't have a stake it's got a, a big square base on it and that's where a lot of the mechanicals are inside of it but it'll rotate um, 360 degrees and then it'll also drop the fan all the way down and pick it all the way back up um, and I've you know I've kind of played with both and I uh, a lot of times I'll run it just with the fan up all the time and just do the rotation of it um, but it's unreal, you know, what a little bit of movement does uh, for you. If you've if you got wind and you have some decent decoys that kind of, you know, bounce around in the in the wind, you're okay. But it's really hard to find a good strutter that, um, that has movement. And this is a way that where you can really um, you can really manipulate the movement of it, no matter if it's calm or windy or what's going on. And uh, it's a fully stru- you know, fully mounted turkey so it looks absolutely lifelike i mean it's unreal how, how good it looks um on top of it so you know if it's it's got guys getting out of trucks and shooting at it it's gonna full of turkey yeah it's gotta look good then yeah absolutely but um yeah so we did that and that was super cool to get his bird at hagan's always a trooper man it seems like no matter what that kid has to hunt you know two days through youth and they'll usually hunt two or three days in regular season before he fills the tag and this year it was a it was a nice you know hour and a half long sit and he was done so um that's always it's always nice because that's really my really my most i guess i'll say the the one that gives me all the nerves or, or you know his his bird and his his deer for the year so get that out of the way and and done um and we knew, you know, I think we had two days, two or three days before we got back on the road and kind of made the what we called the, the COVID-19 turkey tour this year. But um, everything's in lockdown and, you know, it's chaos and we're getting local, locals that are, you know, flipping us off and don't like us in their area because they think we're bringing corona. But we actually traveled oh really goodness, smart. Really? And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, but we actually traveled really smart, you know. I mean, we, we didn't go in unless we absolutely had to, to go to the bathroom or something and uh, always washed our hands, always used hand sanitizer when we got back in the truck, um, paid at the pump 90% of the time, you know. And and it's funny because I'm on my way back now from it, but I think I came in contact with three people, and those were my three contacts in those states. Um, those are the only three people I, I literally was within six feet of. So it wasn't like we were being reckless or careless, um on the travel and I think you know I think if you have it in mind and and um just stay smart about it I, you know I I don't I don't see the problem with it at all but that was No, I don't either. We... Blake, I was thinking about that too and right before they canceled the Nebraska season I was actually had this conversation with my wife that I was thinking about heading out there and I was actually going to call you and see where you know yeah. round about where you're going to be or what time you're going to be out there because I was like man it, it's a perfect time to go do this. And right. we had this discussion, me and my wife, and I was like, the only person you're going to, like, I'm not going to see anybody. There's not really, right. like, like you said, pay at the pump. You can do all these things to kind of keep that social distance. And even you can do that, if you're common sense, an adult, any way, right. shape, or form, you can do that even with your buddies while you're hunting. So, uh, but I'm Absolutely. glad you brought that up and just pointed it out, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, you know, I've got some flack from it and, and uh, it is what it is. I mean, like I said, we're not being reckless. We're not, we're not by any means. I mean, none of us want to get this thing. None of us want to help spread this thing. 
obviously we're being mindful of it. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I can't shut down. I've got, you know, I've got 30 days, essentially 35 days roughly, I'll say, in the spring to where we got to get all the content for the year for turkeys. And I can't, uh, I can't sit at home. It's not something I can go back and do in the end of May whenever they release all this stuff or, you know, they say the numbers are going down. I mean, I, I just got to gotta make it happen. So, um, you know, if I think if at any point it was going to be a thing that was dangerous or I felt like was risky or any of that, then obviously, you know, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have done it. But um, it makes sense. And ultimately, uh, it still makes sense, you know, on, even on the way back. So. Yeah, absolutely. And God forbid this last to the fall, but to me, the same thing goes for deer hunting. It'd be very easy to do in the same token, the same manner that you're, you're speaking of right now to, to deer hunt in that manner, you know? So I don't, absolutely, yeah. I don't fear, you know, that, uh, hopefully, I mean, we're done with this in May or June and we don't even have to think like that. So I'll just stop talking about that. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I, I tell you what, it scares me, the, the thing, and I'll just get off topic a little bit, but the, the thing that scares me the most is with states, you know, restricting non-resident travel like that is is a matter of, uh, you know, can, uh, like Kansas, for instance. Kansas started smart. Like they they had a quarantine list. And they had, like, really high, you know, areas of really high concentration of the COVID-19 stuff. And those people had to be quarantined for 14 days before they came. Like, I, I get that one. But, man, shutting it down is um, is going to hurt the state. It's going to hurt the money that comes in. And I, I just – my biggest fear out of this whole situation personally is the economy, not not so much the disease or the virus, I guess I should say. Um, it's more about, you know, what that economy – because – the economy, no matter if I'm smart and, and, and say I do social distancing and say I lock myself in my house for the next three months, the economy is still going to affect me no matter what and probably in a bigger way than what the coronavirus would. Um, so that's a, that's a scary thing for me. And I really hope that if, heaven forbid, it does go into the fall, that they um, really try to just educate people better on kind of how to do it right, I guess I should say, for traveling as opposed to just having the solution be don't travel because I think it's, I think that's almost too far on that end of the spectrum to where it doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have a hard time with that. Just logically. I mean, obviously I don't want to lose any bit of freedom from our government. And right. But if you have an airplane in the air right now or a subway or a train, anything that's commuting, any people, I have a hard time believing you can tell me I can't travel in my own car to go (laughs) do an outdoor activity. You're promoting outdoor activities all over the place. Right, exactly. You know, I hope it doesn't, I hope it isn't like a leverage thing. Go ahead. Right. No, no, go ahead. But I, I I was going to say, I just, I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope it's not like a leverage thing from, you know, anti-hunters to where they're like we can we can just dismiss the hunting stuff because that's it's hunting and whatever because it's really probably the best thing that people could do right now is outdoor recreation goes and the safest thing they can go do um it's honestly safer than going and walking in a park where there's other people walking so um absolutely hopefully you know hopefully it comes around but we'll we'll see Uh, and totally off topic but our our uh New governor just asked everybody to not use motorized boats. And this time of year, if you live anywhere near the Great Lakes, everybody's walleye fishing like crazy. You can, you know, pretty much be by yourself on a boat on the river, Detroit River, Lake Erie, and fish. And she just shut all that down. So I I just don't get the, Mm -hmm. you know, how crazy that is that you're promoting outdoor activities, but you're limiting a father and son from being on a boat together that's motorized. Like it just right, blows exactly. my mind. So, and like you're talking about the economy. I mean, a huge part of the economy here in Michigan is fishing license. Like it's absolutely right. madness what these guys go do out there and slaughter the walleyes. There's boats and boats and boats. And just, I can't even imagine the economic downfall from guys that now won't be buying license for the rest of the summer or the next month or two oh, while, while the fish oh, is absolutely. hot. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's the scary uh, part. And that's the part I, I hope, I don't know. 
<laughs> I just hope it comes out of it all right. Yeah, for sure. So we'll back to turkey hunting and screw the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> screw the bad news. So, no, we wrapped up youth on Saturday. Then we got on the road Sunday um, for, for Kansas because they opened on Monday. Um, got out there. I always hunt with my buddy Cody Peeper um, out in western Kansas. And Cody always has a ton of birds. He's got he runs a ranch out there, and his family owns a ranch, and it's just thousands and thousands of acres. But um, Rio's you know, spread out kind of wide open. They're, they're usually, you know, tight in tight groups this time of the year. And, and, um, really it's usually kind of a tough time to kill them, to be honest with you. We've always kind of struggled with it every year because reaping just doesn't, some of them just aren't aggressive enough for reaping and the hens aren't really breeding yet. So, you know, they're not calling well. And, you know, if you want to, you know, in my experience, if you want to kill a, a Rio, it's the best to go late April because, you can call a Rio for miles. I mean, if he can, if he can hear you and you can hear him gobble, he can be there within five minutes. You know, they just love the travel and they they call really well. And and uh, we got out there and, and quickly realized that like these birds were already spread out. It was almost like you were hunting them in May. They were you know broke up into little bitty groups like one tom and five hens, or heck, we even saw like one tom and one hen out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the hens were already going to nest and the toms were, you know, coming off of hens at, at like noon and, and calling like crazy. So, I mean, we just went into that strategy of, okay, that's easy. Then, you know, we're going to run, we're going to run no, no strutters. We're going to run just hens and we're really going to run and gun, um, which with the bow is always tough because, you know, you got the blind and everything, but we just pretty much ran run and gun with the blind to where we pull into a, a farm and, I'd hit the box call, and we needed a bird to gobble, you know, way away, and I'd hit it again, and if he answered us twice, he was pretty much going to come. Usually, we found out the ones that were, you know, the ones that would gobble the first time had hens if they shut up after that, um, but if they answered you a second time, they were probably, you know, able to come, so we would just get them to gobble twice and then just go at them with the blind and really just try to get far enough to where you couldn't see the truck and pop it, and, and we did that the first day, and Man, it, it was like it was um, like one o'clock, I think, and it was warm, eighty six degrees, and and uh, we got in the literally put the decoys out, got in the blind, and had a bird come in silent from behind us, and we were in the blind thirty seconds, and we hear spit drum, and there's a bird behind the blind strutting, and he ended up going low and couldn't see the decoys, so I keep calling. Well, then I hear other birds coming, and we ended up, well, long story short, we ended up calling in five different birds from kind of different areas all it you know right into our set and ended up having a bird come across and see the decoys you know come in the right way see the decoys and work right in and i uh he kind of held up at 30 and i shot him at 30 and he didn't go you know probably 35 yards um and got him tagged out so we killed you know our first bird opening day in kansas at like two o'clock in the afternoon um so after we figured that out we like, was okay, 86 cool, you said yeah, 86 degrees that day. It Man, was that warm is so freaking out there. Hot, especially the like first that that's probably your legitly first warm day of spring. So it probably felt like it was 106. Oh man, and in a pop up, it was really bad. I mean, it was so warm that my camera actually was throwing a temp warning and actually shut off at one point. Um, no way. It was yeah. It was probably. I mean, it had to be. You know, if you figure in 86 degrees, it had to be 90 something in that line. You know, inside those. Yeah, for those, sure pop-ups for sure but um once we kind of figured that out that that's what those birds were doing you know we we did the same thing the next day and really tried them in the morning they didn't do anything off the roost and then we uh went in midday um found a bird hurt just could barely hear him i mean just could barely hear him we're standing on top of a hill and i could just barely hear him over there and all of a sudden uh ross my intern was with us and ross was like man, I, there's something down there moving. I don't know what it is. You get your binos and look, and I looked, and it was uh, him. He came out of the timber, and he was probably, I'm going to say every bit of like 800, 900 yards away, just coming. We're like, holy crap. So we all run back to the truck and grab the blind and, and no chairs, just grab the blind and a decoy and kind of crest the hill, but we're only probably 100 yards from the truck. And I just put the decoys out. Well, we're right on the, the neighbor's fence. And sat there just probably 10 minutes and here he is he shows up but he's on the other side of the fence and he that bird strutted from 18 yards to 12 yards down the up and down the fence for 43 minutes holy crap and wouldn't cross it 
Yeah, I swear to you, for 43 minutes. And we ended up, I would, you know, I would let him, he'd come back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and I'd talk to him when he'd kind of lose interest, and he'd come back and come back and come back and come back. And finally, I was like, I'm not going to call to him anymore. I'm just going to let him either walk away or cross this fence. Well, after like five minutes, he just decided he was going to cross, and he crosses the fence and comes in and ends up shooting him at 20 yards, and he goes, he went like 10 yards. He went nowhere um, and got, you know, was right down. So those two hunts were kind of cool hunts of just kind of, you know, figuring out what they wanted and usually typically any anywhere you hunt um if birds are going to call you're going to always call satellite birds first uh, especially early in the year because you're you know your your dominant toms are with him and they're not going to call well early so we kind of change our setups for that to where we'll only run hen um and really you know try to be vocal as much as you can because those are going to be the aggressive birds are going to be those satellite birds that are that are really going to respond well and come running, you know, into the decoys. Right. But, um, yeah, so we knocked that out. That was Tuesday. We hung around Wednesday um, to hang out with Peeper a little bit. And then Thursday morning, we literally got up. I I didn't go to bed, but uh, we got up and we got on the road at, like, I want to say, like, 2 o'clock in the morning and made the three-hour drive to Nebraska and got to the blind at like five fifteen, five thirty in the morning, which is about an hour before uh shooting light even is, and uh got set up but Trey had a blind already and I'd hunted the blind when I went when I was there the first time and it's right on a roost and we had probably shoot, I would say hundred and fifty birds within within probably oh eighty, hundred yards of us, you know, when we got in the blind. Um and we tried, you know, we did the same thing. You know, the birds came down. They were still in pretty good groups. There's probably 12, 15 palms in that group in there, and they were gobbling, going crazy, and we ended up calling one bird. The, the gobblers flew down first. All the hens stayed up. Um, called one bird in, and he came, you know, pretty hard and came all the way running in and got about 30 yards, and I wasn't going to shoot him at 30. I wanted to, him to get into the decoys, and all of a sudden the hens – started flying out well as soon as they started flying out he left and went to them and uh so so we sat there he, about, he got out of the ro- roost first that bird did? he did yeah all yeah. all the toms did yeah the, they got down first and just started strutting kind of out underneath you know where the hens were roosted um and you know i've seen them do that before they do it a lot more out west than what they do at home it seems like you know at eastern eastern's kind of wait for the hen to get out um, at least one hen to get out before they get out. But, um, yeah, those western birds, a lot of times, those hens, heck, I've had hens stay in the tree till 9 o'clock wow. up there sometimes. They do, yeah, it's kind of weird. I don't know why they do it. But, um, but, yeah, he had done that and we ended up, you know, we didn't really see much. We called a bunch. We had a lot of birds answer, but they were just grouped up and going to go do their morning routine, you know. So about 9.45, I think we got out of there and we met up with Trey and went to check another place and, uh kind of just checking in these low, you know, low spots of the canyons and found a group of, uh, I think there was like three or four hens and three gobblers with them. And I was like, well, heck, we'll try to reap them, you know. So grab the reapers and pop the corner on them and make it about 350 yards is how far I went. And they never moved. They never came. They never went. They just strutted in circles. So, heck, I just kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going. And I got the 18 yards from them, and they were just strutting in circles. They never would never would come to the to the reaper. Um, but their hens were on the other side of them, so they were kind of in between the reaper and the hens, you know. So I think they just felt content. And they just strut in circles, and there's two toms together. And, they, you know, I'd just wait till they both would face the other direction with their fans out. And I'd raise up and range them and then keep going and... Uh, shoot it wasn't very long at all you know they, they both turned around I just raised up shot one and he went 15 yards and, and died right there and um, got that one done you know so so that how worked how far away um, were you Blake on that shot I was eight, 18 yards 18 yards you shot him there okay yep yeah I didn't I didn't want to keep pushing it if I would have a shotgun I'd just go ahead and crawl on up there and see what happens but man with a bow you gotta be ready and you gotta you know if they turkeys are so you know how they are they're just like a light switch and and uh, at 18 yards, there is no chance I can get my bow up and draw him by the time he'd be on me um, if he decided to break, you know. Right. And that's that was my biggest fear. So I just got into 18 and said, ah, oh, heck, I can I can do it right here. This is all good. So 
Yeah, especially um, like you said, if they turned and gave you the option with the tail feathers up and they were turned, heads completely away from you, it's a good time to shoot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had no idea. I mean, I, I literally raised up over the, I was like, stood up. <laughs> you know, they <laughs> and they were still strutting when I shot them. Like, they had, they just, you know, completely faced the other way with two fans out and standing, literally touching fans, you know, right next to each other. So, um, but yeah, we did that and then got pictures and then we jumped in the truck and made the, about a five and a half hour drive up to South Dakota um, to hunt with my buddy Joe McDougal. And uh, I haven't hunted, I hunted with him probably 10 years ago down around Gregory. And then he kind of branched off and started his own stuff. And I've been being busy and just hadn't got back up there with him. But this year we kind of made a point to do it. And uh, he's, he's partnered with a couple guys and they started this uh, South Dakota Premier Outfitters kind of company that's uh, just kind of launching now they're going to get I don't even think they have a Facebook page or an Instagram page yet but they're going to get it up and running and it's really just three outfitters from that area that kind of all came together um, and just have hundreds of, or tens of thousands of acres of private ground now up there in that area um, and just doing every kind of hunt you can imagine you know from antelope to mule deer the whitetails turkeys coyotes I mean that's where we did that coyote episode that Heath and I went up um, oh, last yeah, month, that was, yeah, that's, yeah, that's where we were, the same place we were turkey hunting up, in, up by, uh, kind of like by Platte, um, South Dakota. But Joe is the absolute, like, animal whisperer. Like, you go to his house and he's like, Dr. Dula, like, there's literally, there'll be 15 mule deer, like, standing on the sidewalk, drinking out of his water bowl he has out for him, and there's turkeys running around everywhere and rabbits and squirrel. I mean, it's just unreal, the, the animals that are around there. And Joe just likes to watch them and interact with them and stuff. That's so crazy. He, yeah, the dude knows this stuff. It's unbelievable. Like, he, he'll pick up, hunt, like, literally hundreds of sheds a year. And, and, you know, he's killed a lot of great 80s and 70s bucks, you know, in South Dakota, which is not an easy feat, especially with a bow. And um, he's That's a That's pretty he's awesome, a, actually. Yeah, he's a hunting machine and really cool to, you know, kind of get to pick his brain and talk to him about he does a lot of unconventional stuff and, and how he kind of has learned to, to work that ground and, and know that ground. It's just unreal. But, um, you know, I really didn't have any doubt with him, you know, for turkeys because I know he does he puts in the work. And he had popped a couple blinds before we got there and, and some shelter belts where these birds have been kind of afternooning and stuff like that. So. We went out, we stayed the night, got up next morning, went out to one spot, and we had like a probably a 25-mile-an-hour wind with like 40-mile-an-hour gust, and it was 28 degrees, and long story short, we, we didn't even see a bird, didn't hear a bird where we were, and I guess the birds decided to stay low. They didn't come up to where we were, but uh, we hunted till about 10 o'clock and then went back to the house and ate lunch and uh, just kind of relaxed, and about... Oh, I'd say probably four o'clock. We went to the shelter belt and looked, and the, there was a big group of toms. Probably I would say twenty or twenty-five toms in this group, with um, I'd say I don't know forty or fifty hens. It was a pretty big group, but they were all in the shelter belt that was probably three hundred yards um, away from us. So we got set up in that other shelter belt that's kind of in between where they were and, and the roost, and just figured we'd just it call softly and you know when they started making their move that evening for the roost that they'll go through that belt and we should have a chance you know um i ran the i ran the strutter again um and i ran three avian decoys hen decoys um just to try to have a group out there and i figured heck if if you know that many toms one of them has to show some kind of aggression to that strutter if they get close enough and they, uh, man, ended up working through, and gosh, we had toms all over us. And the first tom that came in wasn't the biggest or wasn't the, the whitest tipped one, you know. He was just a pretty basic tom, a hybrid. And he came in, and the first thing he does, I have a look-back avian hen, and she's got her head up high, and I really don't use her very often um, unless there's, like, tall grass. But in this situation, I just needed numbers of decoys, so I put her out, but I only put her out five foot from the blind like legitimately at the end of the tie down strap you know in like a double bull i put her right there kind of to keep her out of the action to where the other better looking decoys that actually move a little bit better and the ones i like personally like a breeder and a feeder and all that stuff were a little bit closer to that strutter because i figured that's where everything was going to be um 
And this bird, I don't know what happened, but he fell in love with her. And he freaking came in, didn't pay attention to anything else, went right to her and climbed up on top of her. And it's like trying to breed her as all these toms are coming in. There's like, I don't know, five or six jakes at the strutter trying to fight it. And this bird's sitting on top of my decoy at five feet um, from the blind. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to shoot him, I guess. So... We get everything set up, and I draw the bow sitting down. Well, I can't shoot him because the blind, um, I can just see his head, and that's it. And I wasn't going to shoot his head because he had Jake's behind him, and I didn't want to try to hit one of them if it went through his head or whatever. So I uh, I just drew my bow and, and stood up, and literally it's the first time I've ever shot a turkey standing up in a blind. And it was, I mean, straight down, five feet, and I just shot him in the body, and he went, you know, 15 yards and passed away. And, then the other Toms came in and beat up him and beat up the decoy and got a bunch of video and pictures and stuff like that of them. But just a, just an unbelievable hunt, you know, kind of what you would you would dream of for getting out there. But, um, yeah, so that was pretty much the, the capper to the week. That was the last out-of-state tag I had for this year. So Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I mean how cool, too, to get one in. That's what you always want when you're in a blind, but to get one in that close to where, you know, you got to – physically stand up or you won't get the shot out of the blind is pretty awesome and, and unique because i mean like i said if you're hunting out of a blind especially with bow that's the whole goal is 10 yards and in so literally right. you had one at you know uh three yards practically yeah it was two it was two steps like two wide steps for me so it was like i said i mean if anyone's ever put up a blind where you put your tie down stake is where it was like, it was unreal. I, I literally could have probably grabbed him if I was a little bit more nimble, but <laughs> uh, it was unreal. And I, I've shot a lot of turkeys out of blinds, shot, shot a lot of turkeys, you know, within 10 yards, but never have I shot one, you know, that close before. It's almost like shooting a carp when you're bow fishing, you know, you just kind of look down the arrow and try to get him. But uh, super cool. And, I mean, overall, you know, shoot, that's a that's a heck of a week, you know, it's a week that guys like us dream about because we get to do the travel and we're going to have the opportunities, but it's, you know, typically it's like deer where you just don't know what kind of luck you're going to have. You know, you can hunt your butt off all week and not kill a bird. And I honestly was just going to be happy with coming out of this week with 50% of the tags filled. And, uh, we ended up filling everything and filling everything on the first day, you know, on, on the day we hunted for it, which is unreal. You know, we literally hunted right. four days and, and, um, or five days, I guess, if you want to count youth season here in Missouri. So we hunted five out of seven days and, and shot five birds in, in four states. And it's just, you know, it's cool that it comes together like that. And you kind of got to soak it up when it does because hunting will teach you real quick when uh, if you take it for granted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, you go on a trip like that, you hope to get one down or, you know, and that case where you're hunting multiple states with some extra tags you know like you said 50 percent would be doing awesome but like to knock them and your birds down in seven days is like you know something you really kind of dream of yeah absolutely especially with a bow and on camera it's just that's just two things that just complicate things you know so um but yeah pretty crazy i think it kind of goes to show and hopefully guys can take away from it the the versatility of kind of reading what's going on in your turkey woods you know what i mean you have birds coming in that are that are shying from a re- from a strutter, then take it out of there and throw just hens out, and that can be the game changer. Just little bitty tweaks can really kind of fill the pulse for what the birds are doing in the area. And you know, we we killed birds all kinds of ways. I mean, we reaped one, we shot one without strutters, we shot one with strutters. Um, it's just kind of you, you got to kind of do what they want to do this time of the year. It's it's tough, and it's you know, you give it another two weeks, and you can probably kill a turkey. However, you want to force feed it to them, you know. But yeah, right now absolutely. it's more about, it's more about you know right now it's more about just finding what they want to do and there's so many dang satellite birds out right now you know those young two year old toms that or even three year olds that are just submissive toms that don't really want to fight um, but you can kill them and they're great toms to kill and they'll come in great and they'll work a call probably better than any other bird will but you just gotta have the right decoy set up where they finish well and. We just got lucky and got that, you know, found that out early in, in Kansas and, and kind of got it right um, throughout every state and kind of, you know, changed it up, used the reaper in one where we thought we could get away with it. And that was kind of the cool thing for me is just the versatility of how we were able to do it and, and still have the success. So it's always a win. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I like what you said there about just, you know, taking the time to kind of read the turkeys and and going along with that because, like you actually had said earlier in the podcast, you know, they're they're a little bit temperamental. And, mm-hmm. and that can really work to your benefit because they could not come in one minute and then, like you said, you pull that out, you know, once you kind of get that clear – where they can't see you pull out that decoy and a second later they kind of forgot that bird was even there and they come running. Right. So right. Oh, exactly. if you can yeah. read them and, and kind of work that language, I mean, anything can happen with those birds, especially out west where they're a little little bit less pressured than like you have in Missouri and I have in Michigan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, if you can, I mean, there's there's always a way to kill a turkey. You know what I mean? There's not a turkey that's just unkillable. There's, I mean, there's some that are, are tough. Don't get me wrong, but... Um, you know, you start dealing with call shy birds, that's tough. You start dealing with uh, decoy shy birds aren't as bad. You just got to, I mean, hunt them without a decoy, you know. But there's there's always a way, and I think guys I think guys kind of get get something set up. I can't tell you how many guys, you know, you talk to before season starts that they're like, I'm doing it this way, and they'll go out and they won't kill a bird for the whole year because they tried it their way, and their way was never you know, what they wanted, you know what I mean? Like, you just, right. just got to be able to say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to blind hunt them and, and I'm going to, you know, if I want to shoot them with a bow, I'm going to blind hunt them and I'm going to run just hens or I'm going to run and gun on them with a bow and no decoys or, you know, there's just, I can't tell you, we just change strategies throughout the year all the time um, for turkeys. And it's just really a matter of, like I say, just reading the pulse of what they do and failing. And when you fail, figure out why you failed and try something new and throw it at them. And, um, you know, if you had a bird shy from a reaper, from a strutter the day before, it's probably going to shy from the strutter again the next day. But if you go in there and take the strutter out and just give him hints, he's probably going to go ahead and work on in. So those are just things where I think guys, you know, make changes on the cuff. They become a lot more successful with it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like you said, it to me it's turkey hunting. And if there's a time to be aggressive or to to do something you don't normally do as a hunter, it's do that during turkey season because who cares? Start, you know, if there's right. not one today, there might be one tomorrow. If there's, you know, one on the neighbors, he might come over today. Like, so change. Don't be afraid to change those tactics because, like, you know, normally we there's a lot of stuff we don't do during deer hunting season. So this is, to me, such a perfect time to be a little more experimental. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, heck, we, it's so funny because we talk about, you know, I run interns every year and my interns, have to come down and film spring turkey hunts because it's the time to mess up <laughs> because you're going to have chances. You know what I mean? We're going to have opportunities. Right. And I can't, I can tell you that, I mean, I whitetail hunt from pretty much September 1st to January 15th, and I can count on one hand how many actual opportunities I have at shooters through that time frame. You know, so um, that's right. Take that and, and take that in, in retrospect with turkeys. I had probably eight chances, nine chances, maybe even 10 chances just this last you know four days right with shooting birds days. in 30 yeah. yards yeah like it, it's just it's there so um you're absolutely right man don't be afraid to come out of your comfort zone with turkeys and, and get you know try try whatever you want to try but just don't force feed it to them like if that's not the way they're gonna you're gonna kill them then try to adapt it and change it and see if they like it and and go from there you know yeah exactly no that Again, that's the one cool thing about turkey hunting is they'll let you know if they're interested. Because if they're interested, Absolutely. they're coming. So don't be afraid to yep. do anything until that point to change until they're interested. Because once they are, they're they're letting you know it's it's working. So yep. uh, that's the cool thing about turkey hunting for sure. So yeah, but, absolutely. But man, thanks, Blake. Man, I'm super excited. You had uh, such a great week, and always fun to get with you and chat with you and. Uh, What's uh What's next? Yeah, so Missouri opens on the twentieth. Um, I may end up trying to go somewhere else. I've got some options to go to like Oklahoma this week or going out to Eastern Tennessee this week. Um, it's really just going to matter on if how much I want to travel. I, I kind of want to be home right now and and sleep in my own bed for a couple nights at least and actually yeah, sleep. I don't blame but, you. Um, yeah, I get kind of rested back up. If I get a wild hair, I may go somewhere at the end of the week. But ultimately, getting ready for. Missouri in the 20th and I get to pick up a shotgun finally and I'm gonna shotgun two reaper birds and try to you know we're gonna try to do the whole two foot three foot 
try to break the five foot mark with shotgun and a reaper, which I think we can, I think we can pull it off. But we'll uh, we'll see. It's always fun to get back home and and reap some birds with the those easterns are just ruthless when it comes to aggressiveness and coming right. into a reaper really yeah. well. And heck, if you got a shotgun in your hand, you can lay there and let them come the whole way. So pretty excited about throwing down some content for reaping and stuff like yeah. that. That's the twentieth. You guys start. Yep. Okay. Yep. We start the twenty. Yep. Cool. Well, perfect, man. Well, good luck. Good luck that day on the 20th. I think ours, if it doesn't get canceled, it's the 18th. They actually changed it this year. You, usually yeah. it's the 20th or would be the 20th this year, but they actually uh, changed it, which is nice because wow. it opens on a Saturday. Usually it's always on a Monday, but uh, yeah. best of luck, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll catch up another podcast after you uh, reap a couple more. Yeah, absolutely, man. Stay safe, okay? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, right, as you guys know, every week you can find us on the Unfiltered Outdoor app, iTunes, Outdoor Podcast Channel.